the strong actions we have taken ensure that Americans' deposits are safe. Certainly, we would be prepared to take additional actions if warranted. They do not have the authority without congressional action to ensure the deposits in open banks. I think what they did was uh, broadly appropriate. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of cards are going to be turned over. Next one or two weeks will be very crucial for the banking sector. This is an important period. They've got to show that they can manage both this as well as a crisis in, in confidence. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 9 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. More fallout from the Swiss bank deal. UBS tries to prevent an exodus of Credit Suisse's top talent in Asia. Meanwhile, both lenders are said to be facing a probe into whether employees help Russian oligarchs to evade sanctions. Janet Yellen tries to reassure markets. The Treasury Secretary says regulators are ready to take further steps to protect the banking system if needed. And EU leaders will renew their push for a banking union in the wake of the recent turmoil. They'll be joined in Brussels by the ECB president, Christine Lagarde. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Kriti, it is very nice to be back with you today. Apparently, I missed something of a wild ride on markets. <laughs> Whether that is over is a big question because European stocks selling off once again today. Yeah, I have to say, missed a historic great decision, Anna, but that's OK. I'm sure there will be plenty more to come, uh, reflecting in some of the risk-off sentiment that you are seeing in the markets today. To your point, you see it in Europe, you see it here stateside as well. Take a look at what futures are doing right now. Simply this idea that they are down two-tenths of 1%. No major conviction, no major major sell-off just yet, but certainly something that could be setting the tone for the rest of the day. Remember, it is going to be a weekend uh, here, uh, so there is going to be this natural sentiment, uh, given the banking turmoil, that they're to pull out ahead of whatever news uh, the weekend may bring. I also want to get to the bond market here, Anna, because the historic rate decision that you missed put the markets into a tizzy. The two-year yield, 371 is what we're looking at. A 12 basis point move lower already. A lot of that coming out from data that you are seeing over in Europe, actually having a read-through into the U.S. market. Market. But I think for me, what's so striking is that the two-year yield is sustainably below 4%. That just means that the market, at the end of the day, is pricing in rate cuts, even though the Federal Reserve has been very clear that they don't have rate cuts on their mind at all. And nevertheless, as you see yields drop, the dollar actually stronger. And once again, this coming from weakness in the euro, again, from that European data. So it feels like Europe really in the driver's seat today, Anna. Uh, the dollar higher by about four-tenths of 1%. NYMEX crude is going to continue to be a story as we inch closer and closer to potentially 100 dollars a barrel even though some of the wall street consensus is that it's not going to get there 68 handle on nymex crude let's have a look then at the european picture critty and as you mentioned we are seeing some weakness coming through here so european stocks definitely on the back foot down by more than one percent on the FTSE, on the cat care and on the zetra dax in focus the banking sector let's roll on and show you where we are on the banking story because the banking sector is the weak spot uh, today for european markets we're down by just over three percent so if you thought this was over uh, we're now selling off again on european banks just to put that in context back to where we started the year so we've unwound once again all of the gains of 2023 in terms of that european banking sector we'll see if we bounce again, which is what we did last time we were at this point a little bit earlier on in the month of March. Interesting to see that UBS Group is down 5.2 percent. Uh, we've seen downgrades on the banking sectors to Deutsche Bank. We've seen downgrades from some analysts around UBS Group as well. So uh, analysts having their say on what they see as the future shape of Credit Suisse and UBS together, what that does to their ability uh, to, to make estimates there. Jeffrey taking a, a downgrade to UBS. We've seen a downgrade, as I say, to Deutsche Bank. Um, are we through the acute phase of this storm? That's how we saw it described by some. Bill Winters over at Standard Chartered has used that phrasing as well. So that's certainly one of the big questions as we watch what's happening here. Away from the banking sector, J.D. Weatherspoons, if you certainly, if you need a drink, this is a pub chain and this is uh, maybe where uh, many people's heads are as we head into Friday, a little bit early perhaps, but certainly getting towards the weekend. If people are looking for something a little bit different, uh, then here is an, uh, a, a hospitality business, I should say, and the stock is up by just over 7%. It seems some of the supply chain issues that have been bothering the business, not so much a focus. But back to the big picture, back to the macro. Here's the weakness in the euro that Chrissy you were referencing and I'll pull together a few themes here is the weakness in the euro is it just to do with flight to the dollar we are seeing some dollar strength in amidst the turmoil in other markets today so that's uh, worth noting and so that's weakening the euro weakening the pound is it to do with weakness in the European banking sector is that what we're seeing expressed here on the macro front as well or is it to do with some of the data that we just had we got euro area manufacturing uh, PMI that came in at 47.1 that was below the forecast so just as we saw from Germany and from France there's weakness 
weakness on the manufacturing side, below the forecast and in contraction territory. In contrast, the services side is well into expansion territory and above forecast. So a mixed picture really coming through on those PMIs then, Chrissy. Yeah, is it uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? That seems to be the story in the currency in the bond markets. And uh, I want to get to a Bloomberg exclusive. UBS wealth boss Iqbal Khan told Credit Suisse staff in Asia that retention packages could come as soon as next week. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg Finance Editor Tom Metcalf. Tom, why is UBS taking such drastic measures? Yeah, really interesting insight into this town hall he was doing in Asia. And, and basically, you know, they're looking at these Credit Suisse wealth bankers. It's one of the main reasons uh, UBS, you know, was sort of incentivized to buy Credit Suisse. And they're desperate for them not to walk out the door, you know, particularly the top talent here. So what they're really looking at kind of rewarding or sort of locking people in is those bankers who, if, say, they, they move to another rival, might take, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of clients' assets with them. So, you know, clearly a move here. And, and it goes to show, I think, where UBS's priorities are. It's the wealth business, it's the asset management business. And that's where they will be, uh, you know, seemingly happy to sort of pay up a bit just to make sure they, they get what they bought. OK, so they want to make sure they get what they bought, focus on those wealth clients. Really interesting to see Iqbal Khan playing that role there, uh, given his yeah. role at both Credit Suisse and UBS, of course, uh, previously at, uh, at Credit Suisse. Now, Bloomberg has also learned that the US is investigating uh, banks, including Credit Suisse and UBS, over whether they helped Russian oligarchs to dodge sanctions. How big a deal can this probe be? It isn't just these two banks, but clearly they stand out. Yeah, look, sanctions probes are, are, are never good news, right? And, and, you know, if you look in history, you know, some of these sanction probes are resulting in fines, like, you know, in the billions of dollars. So, you know, this is UBS, Credit Suisse. We understand there's a few U.S. banks involved as well. Uh, so, no, it could, could well be pretty significant. And I do wonder whether those banking moves you were just outlining, you know, this downdraft in the market today is at least in part impacted by, by this news. Bloomberg, Tan Metcalf, thank you as always for breaking down that story. The saga continues over in Switzerland. Stateside, the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says regulators are prepared to take more steps to protect the banking system only if warranted. That comment to Congress came a day after her remarks on nationwide deposit insurance that rattled markets. Enda Curran, Bloomberg economic reporter, joins us now for more. And uh, it's interesting, we're talking about reinsuring deposits, but what's the thinking here on how that's going to get funded? Well, I guess the first point was the Treasury Secretary was trying to calm markets and reassure investors, like you said, and roll back some of the confusion that came out of her earlier remarks to lawmakers during the week. She was essentially saying the Treasury is there, willing to take uh, whatever steps are necessary to uh, backstop depositors when it's merited. So she's trying to tread a fine line. She's obviously not wanting to, to suggest that they have the, the, blank, the authority to give out these kind of blanket backstops to banks and depositors. But she also realizes, of course, it's a very fragile situation, very fragile sentiment towards US regional banks in particular at the moment. And she's trying to make clear that regulators do have options that they could consider when and if it's needed. So, you know, it's a confidence play. It's a classic role of an economic official trying to ensure confidence in the system, reassure investors they're willing and ready to take whatever steps are needed. But of course, she has to balance the, 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 real, the, the real politique of that situation as well, making sure Congress mm -hmm. are inside, while also, of course, while also, of course, trying to tread the whole moral hazard debate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ender, there might seem to be a tension between the comments we heard from her one day versus another, the first day of testimony versus the second. But Dan Tarullo, formerly of the Fed, uh, making the point to Bloomberg TV in the last 24 hours that there is, a, there is a, a difficulty here because there are limits to what the Treasury can do, along with the FDIC, without the support of Congress. And that's what's being reflected in the two different testimonies that we got from Yellen here. Yeah, no doubt about it. Politics are, is a big part of this. You know, essentially the Treasury would have to make sure they've got the political backing, the backing of Main Street to go out and say backstop the banking system in one shape or another. That's not always popular. You know, banking depositors, depositors is one thing, but bank, uh, backstopping other parts of a bank isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily always go down well with the public and making sure that the taxpayer isn't on the hook. So there's lots for the Fed and the Treasury to navigate in this. It's the same story for regulators all around the world when it comes to dealing with the banking issue. But I think right here, right now, the biggest focus for Ms. Yellen and, and others is trying to drum up confidence, talk up confidence that the regional banking story in the US is, uh, is under control, that there isn't a systemic threat to the broader banking system and, and certainly not the bigger banks. And that's obviously the core message that the authorities are trying to get out there at the moment.
Yeah, and uh, thank you very much, Bloomberg's Enda Curran, joining us uh, with the latest uh, on what we heard from Janet Yellen and indeed the broader banking story. Now, banks in focus for European leaders as they uh, gather. They'll continue a high-level meeting today, a second day of those meetings taking place in Brussels. Yesterday, the key focus was on Ukraine. Today, it's all about the economy after a week of turmoil. ECB President Christine Lagarde will join leaders to brief them on the economic and financial situation in Europe. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo, who's in Brussels. Uh, good morning, Maria. What can we expect then from President Lagarde. Yes, good morning, Anna. And this is a meeting that I believe should have started, but has actually not, because I can still see motorcades coming in from uh, European leaders uh, gathered here. And of course, the big star of the morning is going to be the head of the European Central Bank, uh, Christine Lagarde. There's a lot of uh, appetite here, and you can really see it uh, from the political side of things to really hear from the Central Bank the assessment of what happened on a very turbulent uh, week for banks. And and again, once again, and you alluded to this at the start of the show, we have seen a frenzy of communications from the head of the European Central Bank. This is the fourth time she speaks in a week, but sentiment keeps flipping. We've seen that European banks are now down this morning. So again, she's going to have to go back to this message of instilling confidence in this market. And I suppose and presume once again hammering down this message that they can handle both price stability and financial stability. And that means bringing inflation back uh, to 2% to target. But it is obviously a tough environment for the head of the European Central Bank because the sentiment just continues to flip over and over. The question is now what kind of remarks uh, she'll tell European leaders. This will be behind closed doors. But obviously we'll try to bring you anything that we can hear will be on the case to chase anything for you. Meanwhile, Maria, the war in Ukraine rages on. President Zelensky spoke to leaders yesterday via video conference. Walk us through what he said. Look, uh, President Zelensky did uh, participate in this meeting. Now, he's done it now pretty much essentially for every European summit since the war started. And a uh, source told me that essentially it came down to two messages. One is that he concedes essentially that he cannot put a date to the end of the war, but he is convinced that this joint effort, the stamina from the West to defeat Russia, cannot recede. Those were his words. Then secondly, again, repeating this idea of we need the ammunition, no more delays. And also he questioned the rationale as to why Ukraine cannot get access to modern fighter jets. So a lot of the same narrative uh, we heard in, in a week, which, by the way, was politically, geopolitically very important. You had the leader of China, Xi Jinping, going uh, to Moscow. A lot of this overshadowed by the vibrations of the market. But nonetheless, the war is still going. And that was a message from Zelensky yesterday. This is still fighting. And just the pace of fighting has intensified to the extent that Europeans have now promised that they will deliver 1 million artillery shells in 12 months. That just gives you an idea of just how intense this is. A crucial and frankly heartbreaking conversation. Maria Tadeo in Brussels covering every angle of it. We thank you as always. I want to bring the story back to the states here and into the markets. The payments company Block exploring legal action against Hindenburg Research after the short seller claimed that it facilitated fraudsters. Block called Hindenburg's report factually inaccurate and misleading. The stock is down in pre-market to the tune about 4.2 percent after suffering its biggest intraday decline in three years just yesterday. I want to get to some of the other stocks we're watching as well because Square and Block, or Block formerly known as Square, uh, is not the only one that's down. First Republic is as well. But take a look at the conviction here, Anna. It's only down two tenths of one percent. These are not the 40, 50 percent swings in either direction that we are so used to over the past couple of weeks. So it really brings to the question of how much of the trade in some of these banks is actually based on fundamentals as opposed to other factors like technicals, for example, or simply uh, vehicles of volatility. It gets a little nerdy, but uh, stick with me. On the other end, you do have some major gainers. The defensive bid into the market. NVIDIA, for example, on track for a 10th straight day of gains. Again, lacking a little bit of conviction in the pre-market, but keep an eye on this name because it is higher by two tenths of 1%. Every time we see some sort of defensive bid to the market, NVIDIA rallies even more in addition to, of course, their investment in AI, which continues to be a theme in technology, Anna.
Coming up on the programme, then we'll talk about the broader markets, the sell-off we're seeing into the weekend here in Europe. How much do we need to read into that? We'll talk to Henrietta Pacmont, head of global fixed income at Allspring Global Investments. Is this to do with banking weakness? Is it to do with the way that uh, the, uh, central banks are tapping Fed facilities? We'll certainly get into that conversation. We'll also discuss TikTok's fight against US lawmakers. It was intense yesterday on Capitol Hill. Lindsay Gorman joins us, senior fellow for emerging technologies at the German Marshall Fund. Where does this leave TikTok? Uh, and can it survive as a platform in the United States? We'll get into that conversation shortly. This is Bloomberg. Well, it's been a fascinating day uh, and I would say week, month in the markets. It kind of feels like we're going back to a little bit of habitual trading when it comes to how you actually play a market where you don't really know what the Federal Reserve is doing. You don't know what a how bad the banking crisis is and you really don't know how effective the moves to kind of tamper down inflation are going to be. And of course, the timeline on all that plus the scary R word. When you have that kind of uncertainty, it only makes sense to buy those defensive stocks. And surprise, surprise, that is exactly what we are seeing. Take a look at this chart for our radio audience stick with me here we are looking at the quarterly percentage change uh, in the MSCI world growth index relative to the value index so think about your names like your apples your Microsoft's anything that has that kind of a long-term value add those are the stocks that are outperforming and you might add outperforming by the most going all the way back to 2000 it really speaks to the idea that you are seeing a defensive trade and potentially the start of another bull market rally at least if you are defensively led uh, in a defensively led index like the S&P 500. Joining us now for a little bit more context, Bloomberg Cross Asset Reporter Denitza Sakova. Denitza, what do you make of this tech rally? Is it just defensive or do you think there might be something a little bit more sustainable to it? Yeah, so what we've seen really um, is, is that crazy tech health performance. Um, uh, the really, what we saw value was doing very well for a long time and now uh, tech is back. Of course, a lot of this ties in with what we're seeing of market expectations of the Federal Reserve. We've seen the market has been quite positive. He's seeing peak rates in May. It's pricing in a lot of uh, red, uh, rate cuts going forward, which, of course, a lot of people are saying won't happen. Even the Fed um, is, uh, has been reluctant to say that, and he's said that there will be no rate cuts. Uh, so, of course, this big bet on tech is very reliant on what the Fed does next. And what are, what are we going to see from inflation print? Yeah, absolutely. And with that focus on tech, the Nasdaq now nearly in bull market territory, isn't it, uh, Denisa? Let me take us broader, though, and think about the attitude to risk that we're seeing in markets here, because we're seeing something that our colleagues on the Markets Live blog say reminds them of 2008. Not necessarily the scale of any crisis, a lot of different views out there on where the banking sector goes from here, but the way that we're seeing markets position ahead of the weekend, we're certainly seeing a sell-off in risk assets ahead of the weekend here in Europe. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been an interesting week. We saw the VIX spike initially, now the VIX is down. We saw bond volatility spike initially, now bond volatility is down. Uh, S&P has been up for two weeks, if, if today, obviously, the, the moves hold. So people would read that things have not been that negative, but we actually saw, uh, in terms of global flows, we saw people selling equities at the fastest pace in seven weeks. So there is some uh, reduction of risk exposure. Of course, it's important to remember that investors overall went into this uh, with slightly underweight equities, so there hasn't really been uh, a huge move, but investors are definitely reducing risk. Mm. Another interesting thing we're seeing is investors are hedging volatility. We've seen a rise uh, in investor buying uh, VIX options and calls, uh, but that's not for immediate future, but rather for the next couple of months. So there is definitely some anxiety that there may be a spike in volatility and more um, downturn from here. Yeah, and weekends can be dangerous things, as we know. The UBS share price down by 5.2%, European banks down by 3.3%. Denise, thank you very much for the analysis. Denise Sikova joining us there on the markets. For more market analysis, check out MLIV Go, the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. Now keeping up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. U.S. prosecutors have charged Terraform Labs co-founder Do Kwon with orchestrating a massive cryptocurrency fraud. It's said to have wiped out at least $40 billion in market value. Kwon was already a fugitive from charges in his native South Korea and was arrested Thursday in Montenegro. Billionaire bond investor Jeffrey Gunlock is joining the Jerome Powell is wrong chorus. The chief investment officer of Double Line Capital sees the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates substantially soon. Markets are signaling the Fed is wrong when it talks about the prospect for further interest rate hikes. On Capitol Hill, the appearance of TikTok CEO failed to placate lawmakers eager to ban the viral video sharing service. Sho Chu told a House committee that TikTok operates independently of its Chinese parent firm. But members of the panels clearly didn't buy his answers about whether China could access the data of the app's American users. Twitter will start removing so-called legacy verified marks from user accounts as next week. The platform is working toward a model where only paid subscribers and members of approved organizations have that status. Twitter has made the blue verification mark a major feature of its Twitter blue subscription offering. Owner Elon Musk had priced it at $8 a month, Anna. A lot going on in the social media space. Absolutely. We'll talk uh, more about TikTok and its fate later on in the program. Up next, though, we will get back to the markets conversation. Henrietta Packmore joins us, head of global fixed income at Allspring Global Investments. We've seen the incredible volatility at the short end of the U.S. rates curve. Uh, that continues, really, with uh, sizable moves. We're seeing the two-year yield come down another 13 basis points this morning, 3.69%. Where does she expect the Treasury story to head next? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. More fallout from the Swiss bank deal. UBS tries to prevent an exodus of Credit Suisse's top talent in Asia. Meanwhile, both lenders are said to be facing a probe into whether employees helped Russian oligarchs to evade sanctions. Janet Yellen tries to reassure markets. The Treasury Secretary says regulators are ready to take further steps to protect the banking system if needed. And EU leaders will renew their push for a banking union in the wake of the recent turmoil. They'll be joined in Brussels by ECB President Christine Lagarde. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Chrissy, European equity markets selling off once again as a result of concerns around the banking sector, it would seem. They seem to persist into the weekend. Um, and US features look a little unsure of which direction to head in right now. Yeah, a little lack of conviction, a little lack of momentum, but also completely natural on a Friday, Anna. I think in the last couple of weeks we've seen this hesitation to really kind of hop into the market on Friday, simply given the banking news. A lot of that happens when markets are closed. Remember, we are still waiting on news for things like acquisitions of First Republic stateside, the readout on the UBS Credit Suisse deal. A report just yesterday that that deal might take, out, take place fully at the end of April in terms of the actual merger. So a lot to digest, a lot of which, again, happens over the weekends. To your point, Anna, though, futures down about four-tenths of one percent on this side of the Atlantic. The bond market is what catches my eye here. Two-year yield sustainably above 4% and with no signs of heading back to that key level. 369 on the front end of the curve. A 13 basis point move already baked into the markets. Now, some of this is going to be from the read-through of the European data, but some of this is also going to be this massive amount of rate cuts that the market is pricing in going into the back half of the year. That kind of essentially puts a lid on yields when it comes to the U.S. bond market. The dollar moving in the opposite direction, though stronger by three-tenths of 1%. I'm told a lot of that was happening when the European markets actually opened. So not necessarily data driven there, but certainly a, a lot of fund flows moving in the FX space stronger by three tenths of 1%. NYMEX crude though, Anna, trading at a 69 handle, something we have to watch when we talk about the inflation story. That's the macro picture. I want to get to the micro. Square is top of mind or block, I should say, now it's known. I have to get rid of that habit. It's kind of a tick for me. Uh, block, formerly known as Square, Jack Dorsey's a child basically, down about 4% on the day. This comes after they vowed to fight back after Hindenburg report uh, Hindenburg research had a report yesterday alleging lapses in the compliance process so a lot there uh, block 
has very uh, openly said that, look, they're going to fight the uh, potentially Hindenburg and SEC on any sort of those allegations because they just don't want the pain in their stock market. First Republic also top of mind, remaining volatile after a whipsaw from Yellen's comments yesterday. And remember, we are going into that weekend. How much of that news are we going to get? Those shares higher by about two tenths of one percent. NVIDIA now pairing a lot of their earlier gains. Remember, they were on track for their 10th straight day of gains. Now it looks unlikely they're going to hit that 10th day. But nevertheless, Anna, that defensive bid you're seeing in the market has historically reflected in NVIDIA. What's going on in Europe? Right, yeah, First Republic Bank, a move of a quarter of 1%. That doesn't sound much in the in, in recent uh, banking move terms, does it? Uh, I'll show you some bigger moves in the banking sector, and they're happening right here in Europe this morning. This is the picture for overall equities then, down by 1.2% on the stocks Europe 600. The banking sector is the weakest sector this morning, down by 3.4%. We've seen a downgrade to Deutsche Bank. We see their CDS just creeping up a little bit this morning. Uh, so there's a focus there on what's happening with the rest of the banking sector. And as I say, it is the weakest sector for Europe today. Outside banking, but in financial services, uh, the way that these sectors fall. UBS Group is down by just shy of 5%. So uh, a drop at the start of trade. Was that what led to some of the weakness we've seen in the euro? There, there could be a link there. Some suggesting uh, that that might be what's going on. A little bit of repositioning away from risk assets as we head into the weekend is the line coming from our colleagues on the markets live blog. So certainly a lot to watch. Further weakness in the banking sector, a key focus for us. We talked about the eurozone uh, PMI data that broke half an hour ago, Chrissy. We've just got the UK part of that. UK manufacturing PMI coming in at 48. The forecast was for 49.7. So once again, we see the manufacturing side of things disappointing. That was the story for the individual parts of the Eurozone and for the Eurozone picture as a whole. The, the services side, UK March services PMI falling to 52.8 uh, against a forecast of 53. So just like in the Eurozone, in expansion territory, but unlike in the Eurozone, that number weaker for the UK than had been expected. And so do we see any movement on the pound? Well, we had seen a weaker pound ahead of that number. We got, re we got uh, retail sales number uh, numbers out a little bit earlier on on the UK economy. I mean, they were actually better than had been expected, even if still relatively subdued. We don't see a great deal of market action in a, a market that's dominated, perhaps, critty by a stronger dollar this morning. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what that ECO data has a reflection on when it comes to the yield picture, because I, I got to say, Anna, one of the things that is mind boggling to me is what is going on in this bond market. Who better to perhaps clarify things for me than Henrietta uh, Pacment, head of global fixed income at Allspring Global Investments. Henrietta, a pleasure to have you on the show. Let's Let's start with the front end of the U.S. Treasury curve, if we can. To what extent is it pricing in cuts, and to what extent are we going to see it go back to 4% on the two-year yield? Um, so I think there's been a big change uh, given the volatility that we've seen over the past 10 days or so um, and some of um, the noise that we've been seeing um, in the financial sector, uh, particularly in the US. Um, so I think the moves that we're seeing there are a reflection of that um, and the fact that um, the Fed is going to get a bit of help um, in its battle uh, against inflation uh, as we expect uh, credit conditions to tighten uh, given the volatility we're seeing in the, in the financial market, particularly in the regional banks. OK, we're certainly focused on credit conditions, watching that data then very closely, Henrietta. I wonder what else you're watching. Uh, we've got a chart that shows the Fed uh, Foreign Central Bank's facility that was tapped for $60 billion, and there's been no information provided as to who accessed that repo facility. Of course, we know about where the stress in the, central ba in, in the, in the banking sector has been of late, and so we can, only, we can only ask and we can only wonder. But is it this kind of data set that's worrying for you? Um, I think these are all the sort of pipes that we're looking at uh, at the moment to make sure that um, things are um, working as intended. Um, and it's been very interesting to see what the central banks have done um, in terms of their latest uh, rate hikes. Uh, they've tried to dissociate what they're doing in terms of their hiking cycle uh, with the conditions in the financial markets. We think that makes sense, uh, but uh, it's still, uh, you know, we're thoughtful and we're keeping an eye out on uh, any metrics that may uh, show signs of stress um, in the in the piping of the banking system. Yes, indeed. And with that in mind, I mean, some people point out to me that it is the regional banks, it is the smaller banks in the U.S. that do a lot of the uh, the lending to, to business and to individuals in the United States. And so are you keeping an eye on credit availability? Is that essentially the key factor here as to whether we see a pullback in, in credit availability? That will do some of the Fed's job for it or, or, or we don't? Uh, precisely. Um, and I think, you know, our thoughts are is that uh, this is going to help uh, the Fed in its 
fight against inflation. Um, so it's a careful balance to strike um, going forwards. Uh, but yes, it is going in that direction. It should help slow growth, which is what mm. they're looking for, um, and in time as well, continue to help uh, getting inflation down. I've heard some people throw around the phrase credit crunch. I mean, that sends shivers down your brain because it has echoes of 2008. But where do you see a divide between the two? Uh, phenomena. Um, I do think we're in a different situation uh, to what we saw uh, in 2008. Um, however, um, you know, we are looking, uh, as I mentioned, in, t in terms of credit conditions, and um, that is likely to feed into um, fundamentals um, in certain areas of the market. Um, and that's what the central banks are looking for. But it is, uh, you know, a, a tight uh, path mm. to strike at this point. So that credit crunch here, Henrietta, put a time frame on it. Are we going to see it align with perhaps some of the recessionary calls or uh, the rate cut calls in the back half of the year? Or is this kind of an isolated event, given that it's not a systemic risk? It's not 2008, as you point out. Um, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, you've got a few factors coming together uh, at this point. Uh, rate hikes do work with a delay. Um, um, you know, call it 12 to 18 months. We're getting there. Towards the middle of the year, uh, we will be in that time frame where we should be seeing more impact of the rate hikes that we've seen so far. It's been a very fast uh, hiking cycle um, as well, um, you know, be it in the European side or, or the US side. Um, so it is um, starting to have consequences and it's starting to shake out some of the more fragile areas. Uh, we had the LDI crisis in the UK, um, now we have the sort of noise on the regional banks. Um, that's uh, you know, what we're expecting, a bit of a shakeout at this point. Um, we need to see how it feeds into the economy. Um, and you know, if you look at the numbers, even out of the Europe at the moment, um, yes, uh, you know, a bit more weakness on the manufacturing side, but services still coming in strong. Um, that's also the case in, in the US. Um, and that's where we need to see more of a turn in terms of inflation as well. So Henrietta, then, if the banking turmoil is to some extent doing the work of the Federal Reserve and other central banks for it in terms of those kind of potential credit crunch ramifications, in terms of that policy lag that you just mentioned, is that a faster or slower effect to read through into the economy relative to a rate hike? Um, I, I think they're linked, right? It, we're going to see the, the sort of feeding through of those rate hikes um, into the economy uh, continue and accelerate um, over the next uh, over the next few weeks, so if, if in the next few months. Um, so I think um, you know further rate hikes were closer to the inflection point. Um, you know when we talk to our strategists, that's the way they like to, to term it. Um, you know, particularly in the U.S., particularly in the U.K., um, and to a degree as well in, in Europe. Uh, that being said, I'd say that um, you know, some of the turn on the inflation data is maybe a little delayed compared to those geographies um, on the, in, the, in the European uh, zone. Henrietta, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Henrietta Pacman of Allspring Global Investments joining us on set here in London. Coming up, we will talk about TikTok. The CEO of TikTok defending the app to a fairly hostile Congress. We'll discuss with Lindsay Gorman, Senior Fellow for Emerging Technologies at the German Marshall Fund's Alliance for Securing Democracy. This is Bloomberg. We have seen no evidence that the Chinese government has access to that data. They have never asked us. We have not provided. Well, you know what? I've I asked that. that. I find that actually preposterous. I, I have uh, I, looked I, in. I have really seen don't. no evidence of this happening. Mm -hmm. And in order to assure everybody here and all our users, our commitment is to move that data in, into the United States to be stored on American soil by an American company, overseen by American personnel. That was the TikTok CEO, Sho Chu, testifying before a U.S. House committee yesterday. Chu was grilled by members of both parties on Chinese control of the social media site's content. U.S. lawmakers are weighing how to force the parent company to sell its share of TikTok or face a possible ban. Joining us now to discuss uh, from Washington is Lindsay Gorman, Senior Fellow for Emerging Technologies at the German Marshall Fund's Alliance for Securing Democracy and a former White House advisor. Also with us, Mandeep Singh, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst. Lindsay, if I could come to you first, I mean, the headline from this, do you now see a path for TikTok in the United States that avoids either a ban or severe restriction on its operation, given what we saw on display in Washington yesterday? 
Well, I think that at this point, TikTok's goose may be cooked in the United States in terms of any possible action to allow it to continue as business as usual. Right now, there are several possible paths on the table. And I think where Congress and the administration may be heading is towards requiring a forced divestiture of the app from its Chinese parent company, ByteDance. Now, for the average American, that might not actually affect TikTok's operations all that much because users would still be able to use the platform. And one of the really strong talking points that Sho Chu mentioned yesterday was appealing to TikTok's extremely large creator base and user base of 150 million Americans, he said that's almost half the country, which is obviously enormous. So any action is going to have impacts, but I think policymakers who some themselves are on TikTok will be looking for an option that mitigates that impact mm. in terms of the average user. Yeah, Mandy, we heard a lot yesterday from the conversation in Washington that was focused on the extent to which there is a firewall or not between US user data and the Chinese Communist Party. And that's basically what the, a lot of the four and a half hour conversation came down to. Is there anything that TikTok could say? I mean, we talked a lot about te Project Texas, which is supposed to go some way to providing that firewall. Is there anything further that the, the company could do to reassure US lawmakers here? I think they talked about, you know, TikTok having a global R&D and, you know, sharing data with, uh, you know, the folks uh, who are, are probably in China. And, and that's where it becomes hard to decouple the operations, because when you have a global parent company, and that is what's driving a lot of the innovation on the algorithm side, the reason why TikTok is so good is because of its content recommendation. And uh, I don't think they are willing to share that in terms of, you know, the algorithm or uh, what is behind it. And, uh, and, and that will become a sticking point, I think. And uh, a lot of the discussion yesterday was around that aspect that are they willing to share their proprietary algorithm with and, and divest it completely? Mandeep, social media is no stranger to a scrutiny from the government as well. Talk to us about the read through you're getting into other social media companies like Snap, like Meta, uh, like Pinterest even. Yeah, so we did a proprietary survey and it was uh, clear that YouTube is probably one of the biggest beneficiaries, both in terms of users as well as creators because they have a revenue sharing model. Meta is close uh, second. Uh, with Facebook and Instagram. And then, uh, you know, we were surprised by Netflix actually uh, benefiting because their content recommendation is so good. So uh, it's all about where users spend their time. Obviously, a lot of the small businesses have built their business on TikTok and Meta. And so they, they can move to Netflix. But when it comes to the users, they will move, uh, you know, their uh, viewing habits on platforms outside of social media, which would include streaming as well. Lindsay, hop back on in here and talk to us about the read through here for American tech from a geopolitical perspective. Now that you have TikTok under such scrutiny in Congress, does that sort of incentivize another wave of scrutiny on those social media companies that Mandeep just outlined? I think it may. And one of the things that was so surprising and encouraging to me at the hearing yesterday was just how bipartisan in nature the calls and really the scrutiny of TikTok was, but also the calls for broader technology regulation. This is something that lawmakers have been talking about in Congress for five years now, ever since Mark Zuckerberg first testified before Congress um, in 2018. And for the first time, we really saw bipartisan calls for things like federal data privacy legislation that would apply to all social media platforms. Um, but I do think there's something unique about TikTok here. And as Mandeep said earlier, the, there was really a disconnect between what TikTok was saying with the potential to firewall off data and what lawmakers were really grilling him on. Because what he was saying is it's not about ownership, it's about this oversight. And essentially the questions that lawmakers were asking actually went right to the very heart of TikTok's ownership, precisely by its parent company, ByteDance, asking about those financial ties, whether the CEO himself receives compensation from a Chinese company, whether his employees do. So I think these have broader implications for the business community and CEOs who have ties to China, who have these very mm. complex multinational geopolitical 
um, operations that we all need to be thinking about our relationships with China when we're doing business yeah. now because U.S. lawmakers are on alert. Yeah, it felt like there were two wider stories here, way beyond TikTok, Lindsay. One was the wider regulation of social media and some of the things that were being uh, leveled at TikTok, you know, as, as the CEO said, could be leveled at other social media businesses in the US. But the other was the whole uh, cooperation across border to, to manufacture, to make things. And, and we saw the CEO of TikTok talking about the cooperative way that certain things were produced and, and trying to draw parallels with other US businesses. I suppose then there will be US businesses asking themselves once again about their links with China for manufacturing or other parts of their supply chain. Absolutely, particularly when, as regards China's possible human rights abuses with its Uyghur Muslims. That's an issue that Congress and the administration have been really hammering on and making sure that our supply chains are not inadvertently feeding China's surveillance state and China's human rights abuses. This con whole conception of ESG, environmental, social, and governance that businesses have been accustomed to dealing with when it comes to climate risk and other ESG topics really is going to take on this new dimension of human rights when it comes to China. So I think this does apply to all businesses. Obviously, TikTok is uh, an anomaly in the sense that it has that ownership tie to China, but also TikTok won't be the last social media platform that comes from China. It won't be the last popular technology company that comes from China. It's not the first, it won't be the last. And so my hope is that policymakers put some stronger guardrails in place and if for no other reason that businesses can know what to expect when they're developing these operations. Mandeep, I'll give you the final word here, uh, 60 seconds. Talk to us about just the valuation on TikTok itself. Yeah, so when we look at the overall revenue, it's closer to, you know, 16 to 20 billion, and U.S. is probably half of their revenue. And uh, when you uh, use the current social media multiples, we arrived at a 40 to $50 billion valuation. It's somewhat of a discount for the fastest growing social media asset because of all the regulatory concerns. And look, with this uh, consumer internet apps, they're worth zero if they lose engagement. And that's the risk with TikTok. If it gets banned to a potential buyer, once the users move away out of the platform, it's not worth anything. And, and I think that's where you have to put a discount. And uh, we arrived at that 40 to $50 billion valuation for uh, a willing buyer, which could be Oracle, Microsoft, or a consortium of private equity uh, based on our expectations. Okay, thank you both. Thank you both for your time. A really good conversation. Lindsay Gorman of the German Marshall Fund and Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligent. Thank, uh, Intelligence. Thank you both for joining us. As we were having that conversation, further developments on the European banking story. We've been talking all morning about how we see weakness in European banking. And once again, that is weighing on the European stock story. Uh, let's focus in on what we're seeing there because Deutsche Bank certainly to the forefront here. It is the worst performing of these banks this morning. Deutsche Bank down by 11.1%, as you can see, intraday. Uh, what is driving this well some of our colleagues linking the moves we're seeing in CDS here and suggesting we've seen a spike up in CDS Deutsche Bank shares slumping as CDS jumps so this is the cost of insuring against default over at Deutsche Bank as we head into the weekend a sense that investors are trying to de-risk portfolios perhaps and wary of what can happen over weekends as we've seen over recent uh, recent ones uh, and, and we're seeing this in FX markets as well so the dollar is gaining the euro is losing ground the yen is gaining the pound is losing ground so we're pretty risky off this morning as we look to hand over to the United States. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. A real focus on de-risking, it seems, here in Europe. Deutsche Bank uh, extending its drop. That stock down 11.1%. Criti Commerce Bank also down 8%. Stock gen over in France down by 6.5%. Colleagues talking about businesses that are exposed to corporate lending here being uh, in the focus. Yeah, you're seeing it in the stock. You're seeing it in the credit default swap, specifically the five-year surging there. And in the FX space, a read-through into the macro as well. The euro, Anna, at a 107 handle, weakening as we speak. Yeah, and some of these European equity markets now down by more than 2%. The CAC 40 down by 2%. The Zetradax in Germany down by just shy of that amount as we work our way towards the start of U.S. trading. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg.